everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto seven years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the January 27th, 2023 episode of Unchained. If you've been enjoying Unchained, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. With the Crypto.com app, you can buy, earn, and spend crypto in one place. Download and get $25 with the code LAURA, link in the description. Today's guest is Michael Sonnenschein, CEO of Grayscale. Welcome, Michael. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. The Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, or GBTC, is currently trading at a 42% discount to the net asset value, or NAV. Because the 2% fees on the trust are tied to the NAV, People invested in the trust are effectively paying almost a 4% fee per year compared to the price of the underlying. And on top of that, investors cannot redeem their shares for Bitcoin and also would probably struggle to share their shares to somebody else willing to pay those fees. Do you think that's an appropriate fee for investors to pay when they don't have the option to leave the product? Well, so a couple of things to clarify there, Laura. So one, the total annual management fee for any and all GBTC shareholders is 2%, right? And when somebody invests in the product, it's not as though they put a dollar in and 98 cents only goes into you know, giving them exposure to Bitcoin. It's instead similar to other investment products that the underlying Bitcoin per share ratio over the course of a year will decline by 2%. And the fee on the product today, I think is certainly borne by you know, just a lot of costs that go into running a product in the crypto space. It's not analogous today to the kind of economies of scale that you'll see for equity products or fixed income products. And we've said publicly, and I'll say to you again, um, we are committed to lowering the fee on GBTC when it converts to an ETF. But certainly in the meantime, all the fees that are being generated on GBTC that is all the, the capital that we as an organization are putting into our lawsuit against the SEC, bringing the best legal minds possible to the case, and really just continuing to advocate for, for our investors. So we feel very strongly about the case, the full resources of the firm are behind it. And again, yeah, we'll, we'll lower fees in an ETF state. Yeah. So let's actually now just play out some of the scenarios around the lawsuit. You know, for listeners, we'll catch them to see Grayscale is suing the SEC over its denial of Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF application. Oral arguments will be heard March 7th, which is coming up pretty soon. Yep. If it fails, you've said that you would appeal. You know, at this point, you were saying that under the ETF, that's when you would consider lowering the fees. There's another scenario where you would appeal, but if the appeal also is not, you know, is not successful, then are there any other conditions under which you would reduce the fees? Sure. So let me just lay this out just to set the record straight and who better to do it with than you. Contrary to what folks may think, we didn't somewhere along this journey in the last nine years decide that an ETF was the ultimate goal for GBTC, right? An ETF format was what we always conceived of, and that's always what we intended to do even before we launched the product back in 2013. So we have been on a journey for the last nine years, not only growing this product and bringing Bitcoin accessibility to investors in a regulated and accessible, you know, accessible way, but we've always been in pursuit of an ETF. So when we think about the journey that we've been on, yes, it was very unfortunate and very disappointing that the SEC um, denied our application to convert GBTC to an ETF in June of 2022. Investors have been patient. We think investors deserve this. And it really is a signal that in the near term, investors have really seen that their regulator is you know, pretty much shutting the door on the opportunity to take the world's largest Bitcoin fund and bring it closer into the regulatory perimeter. So it left us no option other than to initiate a lawsuit, right? We have a fiduciary obligation to our shareholders. This is what they want and, and this is what they deserve. So we had to proceed that way. The case is moving swiftly. So again, we filed the case in June of 2022. It's now late January, 2023. Oral arguments, as you said, coming up in a couple of weeks. And we do expect a decision on the case by this fall, the fall of 2023. If we lose the case, although we're confident that we have really common sense, straightforward arguments, 
We've definitely seen overwhelming support for the strength of our arguments that the SEC is looking at Bitcoin futures ETFs and Bitcoin spot ETFs in a very disparate way, in an arbitrary, kind of capricious manner. We would seek to appeal the case. A couple of weeks ago as well, in the spirit of transparency, we did really want to communicate to investors that if ultimately we exhaust all of our judicial options, and again, that would really not only be, you know, continuing to fight the SEC in, in a judicial setting, but it would also mean that the SEC was, you know, continuing to deny investors the additional protections of an ETF, and we were done with all options, we would then consider putting out know, a tender offer, right? A tender offer would be a material deviation from the long-term path that this product has been on. And of course, the details of a tender offer would need to be worked out with the SEC, receive shareholder approval, SEC approval. But that would be an outcome that would really, again, be more indicative of regulatory postures than it would be Grayscale's intentions or what investors ultimately want, which we know is an ETF. And can you walk us through what that tender offer would look like? It, it's really tough to say because a tender offer is really rooted in the idea of the details of which being completely fair and equitable for all shareholders. And so when you have a product like Bitcoin, or in this case, GBTC, where the value of the asset moves around every single day, you know, a more bespoke tender offer would need to be worked out with the SEC to get comfortable that the tender offer was being administered in a fair and equitable manner. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, a number of investors are underwater on their GBTC investment and also paying you know, what to them feels like high fees. And I'm sure you're aware that some segment of them are calling for Grayscale to seek what's called Regulation M relief from the SEC that would allow investors to redeem the shares for the underlying asset, which is in this case, Bitcoin. Why has Grayscale not filed for the Reg M relief you know, I, I get, you know, your timelines uh, that you talked about for the um, lawsuit and stuff, but are you essentially saying to these investors that they need to hang on for the resolution to that? Because that obviously is, that's a long, that's, that's a long wait uh, for some of these people that, for instance, have this money in their retirement accounts and are, you know, not really able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. So Laura, it's another great question. And let's, let's take this opportunity to clear up some confusion about this. Regulation M is something that is really tied to ETFs. What Regulation M offers is a product relief from Regulation M to simultaneously create and redeem shares. And so Reg M is an exemption or an exemption from Reg M is something that's granted to all ETF applicants. And so an ETF, as we all know, is a financial instrument that you know, is holding some other asset or giving exposure to some other asset. And because the ETF will move around you know, throughout any trading day, it's important that the ETF is able to be kept in line with the value of what it owns based on creations and redemptions and an exemption from Reg M. So those folks that are calling for Reg M being something that's obtainable in a vacuum, that's simply just not a possibility. And so when we think about the conversion to an ETF, when we think about the application that was denied by the SEC, when we think about now the lawsuit Grayscale has filed challenging that decision, the core part of what that lawsuit is, is not just an ETF, but obviously comes with Reg M relief as well. So the investors that want to see that Reg M relief, they're the ones that you know, are certainly can be frustrated with the discount. We as a team are frustrated with it too. We want to see Reg M relief. We want to see the conversion to an ETF. And that really is the core part of the case and really what we're advocating for. Hedge fund Firtree is suing Grayscale to obtain more details around the trust. And it looks like they're doing so in the hopes of getting Grayscale to resume redemption and also cut fees. Are you going to grant their request for information? And do you feel that shareholders are entitled to that? Yeah, you know, it's funny to see that so many investors are, are taking an interest in Grayscale and Grayscale's operations. We continue to feel that you know, the ETF is going to be the best long-term solution for any and all shareholders. Again, it addresses any concerns over fees being too high because we've committed to lowering them in an ETF state. And we're also confident in the strength of, you know, of our lawsuit. 
um, against the SEC. And so I think given the, the kind of recent mistrust we've seen in and around in the crypto space, there has certainly been you know, a small vocal minority of folks that are further frustrated. Um, and we share in that frustration, Laura, we really do. In a moment, we're going to talk about some of the questionable incidents that have happened around GBTC. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Join over 50 million people using Crypto.com, one of the easiest places to buy, earn, and spend over 250 cryptocurrencies. Spend your crypto anywhere using the Crypto.com Visa card. Get up to 5% cash back instantly, plus 100% rebates for your Netflix and Spotify subscriptions and zero annual fees. Download the Crypto.com app now and get $25 with the code Laura. Link in the description. Back to my conversation with Michael. Last Friday, bankruptcy documents showed that Gemini liquidated 31 million shares of GPTC that had been pledged to it by Genesis. And they liquidated all of that in a single transaction in November. Because GBTC is a restricted security, an issuer of these kinds of restricted securities cannot sell more than 1% of the shares per quarter. And this was actually a sale of 5% of all the shares. Did Grayscale know that this liquidation was going to happen? So as the case is with any investment manager or with any investment product out there, we're not necessarily going to be party to every transaction that takes place. So the result of what you're seeing and when you saw it in the market is the same time our team saw it. So the transaction that you're referencing, I think, was something that was floated through the documentation that Genesis Capital put out as a part of their bankruptcy proceedings that kind of detailed the transaction between Genesis and Gemini. We were not party to the transaction itself, and we're not aware of the transaction itself that it had that taken place. So if the transaction took place as documented, then would you agree that the amount sold was five times the allowed limit? So I am not a Rule 144 expert, so it'd be tough for me to comment on it. I would you know, certainly direct you to, to the folks at Genesis or Gemini to really think through the transaction, although I'm sure both of those parties were very thoughtful um, about the transaction, given the relationship that they have. So another big uh, GBTC trade that's been talked about quite a bit this past year was, for instance, sort of this levered long trade using GBTC, uh, made famous perhaps by Three Arrows Capital. Can you talk about how you think that trade worked? Sure. So I think certainly earlier in GBT's life cycle, we've seen the product trade at both premiums and discounts to its net asset value. And so there was certainly a period of time where GBTC was in fact trading at a premium to its net asset value. And so investors who were subscribing to the private placement when they were locked up, you know, cause of the private placement shares anywhere from either 12 months or eventually six months once GBTC became an SEC reporting company, they had to certainly take the risk on over that 12 or six month period, not knowing where they'd be able to monetize their GBTC shares out in the public market. And so for some investors who waited out that 12 or six month period, they may have reached a time when their shares became freely tradable and GBTC was trading at a premium to its NAV or a premium to where the spot Bitcoin price was, and thus were able to actually monetize their investment at a value that would have earned them a higher return than had they just gone long Bitcoin itself. And so that is certainly something that some investors were able to profit from. And do you think that they were also buying shares of GBTC, pledging that as collateral with Genesis to obtain more Bitcoin, which they were then using to create more GBTC shares? Yeah, so certain investors were able to obtain loans um, to be able to trade in GBTC or to you know create shares of GBTC. The collateral arrangements, I think, with each of those investors would have been different in something that Genesis would have been the party that was extending credit to the investor, not something that was borne by Grayscale. And so for the structure of GBTC, Investors are not allowed to transfer shares um, until after six months, and those shares also cannot be encumbered for for that period. Was Genesis allowing 3AC to use these so-called unseasoned shares, shares, you know, that are less than six months old to borrow Bitcoin? 
Yeah, so I think that there's some minutia um, to get into there, into the legal docs that surround GBTC. And the unencumbrance has to do with the underlying Bitcoin that you know stays within our products itself. And so the Bitcoin that underpins GBTC, the Ethereum that underpins ETHE, those coins are unencumbered. They're owned by the shareholders themselves. They're not loaned out. Um, there's no liens or pledges, et cetera, against them. But there is certainly the opportunity for shares to be pledged in certain financial arrangements, so long as those are disclosed and, and signed off on. Oh, oh, and that wouldn't violate that that restriction against them being encumbered. So long as the pledges are properly like disclosed and, and documented. Okay. Genesis had long been GBTC's authorized participant. And what that means is that's the entity that has the ability to create and redeem shares in the trust. In October, Grayscale changed the authorized participant to Grayscale. And obviously the timing on that, you know, October is the month before things went uh, you know, quite far south in the crypto community. Why did Grayscale make that change at that time? So it was actually a change that I believe we set in motion about a year or a year and a half prior to that October date. As we have been continuing to grow as an organization, some of the functions that we've been working to build out are, for instance, our own broker dealer and our own registered investment advisor. And so in 22, we obtained both Grayscale Securities, our broker dealer and Grayscale Advisors, our RIA. And so it was quite a bit further along than uh, that October timeframe that this was already on a path to having operational independence and actually taking over the role as authorized participant um, here at Grayscale Securities. So this was something that was planned for and just happened to be a switchover in and around that October 2022 timeline. I'm sure you're very well aware the crypto community has a lot of questions about the relationships between Grayscale, Genesis, and DCG. Can you explain sort of what the information is that Grayscale, for instance, has about Genesis, you know, do you know who the shareholders are? Do you know when transfers occur? How is information shared? How are decisions made? Just to outline all of that. Yeah. So I think from an outside perspective, it's sometimes a little hard for folks to wrap their head around. But DCG, Digital Currency Group, is a conglomerate. And there's tons of conglomerates out there. And whether it's, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is a conglomerate that owns NetJets and Geico and other businesses or LVMH has a conglomerate and owns tons of companies underneath it that are operating subsidiaries. I think the DCG scenario is really analogous to those where Grayscale is a standalone entity that has you know, common ownership under the DCG umbrella. The same is true of Genesis. The same is true of you know, Coindesk or Tradeblock or you know, Foundry. And so Grayscale is a standalone entity separate and distinct from these other businesses. I have my own management team surrounding me. We have our own budgets, our own governance, our own policies, our own procedures. As I shared, our own broker dealer, our own RIA. And so we're not privy to or party to um, what's transpiring in any of the other entities, despite the fact that they are owned wholly by Digital Currency Group. And can you also just in that, I mean, maybe you sort of answered it, but I think people are also very curious to know how involved Barry is, Barry Silver, the head of DCG, how involved he is in the decision-making and strategy of Grayscale. So I think given that a lot of what has happened at Grayscale was Barry's idea to start, you know, Barry was the one who was early enough into Bitcoin to say, I think we should start an investment vehicle to make it easier for people to access Bitcoin as early as 2013 when Folks, quite frankly, Laura thought he was crazy. You know, I think, you know, strategically and, and directionally, uh, Barry has set Grayscale out on a path, but then he, you know, brought someone like myself in and I brought a you know, leadership team in around me as well to really execute on that early vision that Barry had. I mean, so he is not involved in day-to-day -day decisions. He's not involved in, you know, changes to policies and procedures. Um, you know, Barry's focus has primarily been on investing at the DCG level, whether that's in protocols. And I think DCG now has invested in over 200 companies um, in over 40 countries around the world. So a lot of his focus there is on keeping track of what's transpiring in the broad you know, crypto asset class on a global level 
and not, you know, being bogged down in the decisions that my leadership team and I are making day to day here at Grayscale. The trust documents were also restated to remove shareholder rights, specifically the right for shareholders to replace the sponsor as long as there was a 75% threshold of shareholders in favor of that. Why was that move made? And can you talk a little bit about the process for changing the trust documents? Yeah, so there have been uh, several amendments to the trust agreement over the life of GBTC and, and other Grayscale products, which is something that's not unique to our product family. You see changes occur all the time in investment products. And to be clear, when changes do come about, to the extent that they are the least bit or possibly adverse to shareholders, they are ratified by a majority of shareholders. So these are not decisions that Grayscale is making in a silo. Um, so it's really important to know that, you know, that exact you know, distinction. So any of the changes that have been you know, put forth out to shareholders have, in fact, given them you know, the statutory opportunity to weigh in on any of those changes and ultimately weigh in on them over time. And do you publish the results of those shareholder votes? You know, that's a really good question. I think the last time the trust agreement was updated may have been as recent as 2016 or 2017, when perhaps there were some changes associated with, you know, converting uh, GBTC to an ETF. Um, but I'm not sure of the exact date or, or the last time the trust agreement was updated. So, you know, as we alluded to at the beginning of this, there are a number of investors in GBTC who are, you know, they're hurting at this moment. And I wondered if you felt that there was anything that Grayscale or DCG could have done differently to engender more trust. Um, if there's anything over the last few years that, you know, you feel um, could have, you know, been improved upon. I got to say, Laura, I think that we have amassed an unbelievable investor base. We have now a million or more than a million investor accounts in the U.S. alone that own GBTC. All 50 states are represented, small holders, large holders, institutional holders. GBTC is inside of ETFs, inside of mutual funds. And so I'm really proud of the team that I built, the work that we've done. And I feel that shareholders do, in fact, trust that we operate as an organization that has, you know, really thought about not only its construction, but its operation. We were born in the U.S. We made use of existing U.S. rules and regulations. We've continued to push the limits on fair and full disclosure for investors. We voluntarily went to the SEC and became the first SEC reporting company. We worked to develop definitions, risk factors, policies, all of which has only resulted in greater shareholder protection. And you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find another asset manager that is, you know, so bold as to actually file a lawsuit against the regulator that oversees every aspect of their business. And that's a decision that, you know, both as a CEO and we as a team, we didn't, we didn't take that decision lightly, but we knew it was the right thing to do for our shareholders. And so we have been on a journey on this path towards ETF, and we continue to, again, feel really strong about our arguments and really continuing to advocate for shareholders. Yeah, and I should add that just before recording, um, Andrew Parrish, who has a very active Twitter feed where he talks a lot about what's going on at uh, Grayscale, DCG, and Genesis, he tweeted that uh, you know somebody took a, a look at the legal arguments and felt that they were very strong to the point where they thought maybe they could even go to the Supreme Court. And um, you know, for more information on that, I either did an interview with Matt Hogan, or I at least wrote an article in which I quoted him, <laughs> I will put whatever whatever piece of content sure. that was in the show notes so people can find out those arguments. But Michael, it has been such a pleasure having you on Unchained. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Laura. Always good to chat. Don't forget, next up is the weekly news recap. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. BlockFi has a $1.2 billion exposure to FTX and Alameda. Bankrupt crypto lender BlockFi accidentally revealed financial documents that showed it had over $1.2 billion worth of assets tied to the cryptocurrency exchange FTX and its sister company Alameda. The extent of BlockFi's exposure to the exchange was not previously known as the financials had been censored. As of January 14th, the documents show that BlockFi assets connected to FTX 
are worth almost $416 million, while loans to Alameda amount to about $831 million. This is significantly higher than the previously reported figures of $355 million in assets on FTX and a $671 million loan to Alameda. The document also reveals that BlockFi's 125 active employees are being paid generously with a combined compensation of $11.9 million a year. Bloomberg reported that BlockFi is selling off $160 million in loans backed by about 68,000 Bitcoin mining machines as part of the company's bankruptcy proceedings. Some of these loans have already defaulted and may be under collateralized given the decline in the price of Bitcoin mining equipment. The entities bidding for the debts will likely be debt collection businesses buying for cents on the dollar. U.S. seizes $700 million of FTX assets. U.S. authorities have taken possession of $700 million worth of assets linked to bankrupt crypto exchange FTX and its former CEO, Sam Bankman fried according to a report from Coindesk. The government is seeking the forfeiture of these assets on the grounds that they are not the property of the bankruptcy of state. The assets in question include $525 million worth of Robinhood shares, which Bankman fried purchased with money borrowed from Alameda Research, and $171 million in cash from bank accounts tied to FTX-related entities. The government seized these assets and more in early January and is now seeking their forfeiture. Furthermore, the DOJ seized $50 million in assets linked to Bankman fried This sum was held in Farmington State Bank, a small one-branch institution based in Washington that primarily focused on providing agricultural loans to farmers. The bank had a mere three employees at the time of Bankman frieds account creation and had been serving the local community for over a century. Additionally, on Wednesday, FTX's long-awaited creditor list was revealed, albeit with millions of customer names redacted. It turns out the bankrupt exchange owes money to a wide range of companies and individuals. Tech companies include Apple, Netflix, Meta, and Amazon Web Services, and crypto firms such as Chainalysis, Coinbase, Yuga Labs, and Binance Capital Management are all owed money. Publications include The Wall Street Journal, Coindesk, and Benzinga, and athletes like Tom Brady and David Ortiz were also on the list, as was supermodel Giselle Bündchen. Sam Bankman fried invested $400 million into Modulo Capital. According to the New York Times, Modulo Capital, an obscure crypto trading firm, received $400 million from Bankman fried prior to the FTX collapse in November. The firm was founded in March 2022 and received one of SPF's largest investments, drawing the attention of investigators. The transactions took place in the third and fourth quarters of 2022. The founders of Medulla Capital reportedly had close ties to SBF. One of them, Xiaoyan Lily Zhang, had previously allegedly been romantically involved with Bankman Freed. Medulla is now a key focus of the investigation by federal prosecutors into Bankman Freed and the exchange. Genesis says it may resolve the bankruptcy soon. Crypto lender Genesis Global Capital expressed confidence that it will be able to resolve its disputes with creditors this week, with a goal of emerging from Chapter 11 bankruptcy by the end of May. According to Reuters, during a hearing in Manhattan, Genesis lawyer Sean O'Neill said, Sitting here right now, I don't think we're going to need a mediator. I'm very much an optimist. Brian Rosen, a lawyer for creditors who are owed $1.5 billion in claims, agreed, We are getting closer. The company filed for bankruptcy protection on January 21st, two months after it halted withdrawals and new originations. The company listed just over $5 billion in assets and liabilities in its bankruptcy filing and said that it owed more than 100,000 creditors at least $3.4 billion. Gemini lays off more employees. Gemini, the crypto exchange battling Genesis, laid off 10% of its staff, according to an internal memo seen by The Information. This is the third round of cuts at the company in the past eight months. The co-founder of Gemini, Cameron Winklevoss, informed the staff, known as astronauts, about the layoffs via a message on Slack. He stated that the persistent negative macroeconomic conditions and unprecedented fraud in the industry left the company with no other choice. Gemini employees are not the only ones affected by Genesis's fallout. Luno, a digital currency group owned a crypto exchange, also laid off 35% of its workforce. Bitcoin Jesus gets sued. Genesis is suing Roger Veer for $20.9 million in damages. Veer, the CEO of Bitcoin.com, has also been long known as Bitcoin Jesus. The lender claims Veer failed to settle crypto options transactions before the expiry date. 
This is not the first lawsuit against Veer, as CoinFlex, a crypto exchange, also filed a lawsuit against him in July for failing to repay the debt on his margin position. In a Reddit post, Veer stated that he has enough money to pay the debt, but that he does not feel obligated to do so. Celsius plans to issue a token to repay creditors. Bankrupt crypto lender Celsius is planning to pay back creditors by issuing a new token, according to a recent report from Bloomberg. The attorney for Celsius, Ross M. Quasteniet, informed a bankruptcy court that the new token would be part of a payout plan from a reorganized company that is properly licensed. However, this plan needs to be approved by a creditor committee before it can move forward. According to Coindesk, the proposed token is called Asset Share Token, AST. Creditors who are owed an amount of crypto above a certain threshold would receive AST, which they can either retain for potential dividends or sell on the marketplace. The platform's remaining customers would be given a one-time distribution of liquid crypto assets. The lawyers for Celsius, the lawyers for Celsius also stressed that despite the recent ruling that assets in Celsius's Earn program are the property of the exchange's estate and not of customers, Earn customers would be treated like everyone else in the eventual recovery of assets. Additionally, the mining division of Celsius plans to temporarily house 20,000 rigs that it is currently retrieving from Core Scientific, which could put the troubled firm founded by Alex Mashinsky in a better position. Binance makes a mistake in its accounting. Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange, acknowledged that it made a mistake in storing token reserves and customer funds in the same wallet, as per a Bloomberg report. The reserves for nearly half of the 94 tokens issued by Binance, known as B tokens, were stored in a single wallet called Binance 8, according to the exchange's website. This wallet contains more assets in reserve than are required as collateral for the issued B tokens, indicating that it also contains user assets. Binance issues its own version of ETH, USDC, and USDT to be used on the BNB chain, which are supposed to be backed by one-to-one -one reserves of the currencies they are based on. However, mixing of B token collateral with customer assets is against Binance's own guidelines. Earlier this week, Binance also announced that its SWIFT banking partner, Signature Bank, will no longer support transactions under $100,000 in value. This change comes into effect on February 1st and will not affect credit and debit card purchases of cryptocurrencies or payments to and from third-party exchanges. Signature Bank is imposing this new transaction threshold to reduce its exposure to the digital asset market. Meanwhile, Binance is on the hunt for a new SWIFT partner to help facilitate its US dollar transactions. Shanghai upgrade is closer. Ethereum core developers announced the successful deployment of a shadow fork, which supports staked ETH withdrawals, as a test for the network's upcoming Shanghai upgrade. The Shadow Fork went live on Monday, and developers plan to test the upgrade's resilience by deploying evil nodes on both the execution layer and consensus layer. The final version of the Shanghai upgrade is set to go live on the Ethereum mainnet in March. It will also allow validators to withdraw the $26 billion worth of Ether that sits in the deposit contract. Additionally, the team at Liquid Staking Derivatives Protocol, Lido, proposed a plan to support staked Ether withdrawals after the Shanghai upgrade is activated. The process will be asynchronous and will have two modes, a turbo mode to unstake requests quickly and a bunker mode as an emergency plan, which will be activated under mass slashing conditions. Moreover, Decentralized Autonomous Organization Index Co-op launched a new structured product that will give investors exposure to the ETH liquid staking derivatives market. Wormhole Hacker levers up on staked Ether. As Shanghai comes closer, the crypto community is getting excited about the potential for staked ETH withdrawals. However, it seems that the hackers are also interested in this new development. Blockchain security firm Certic reported that the wallet address associated with the wormhole hack, which occurred in February 2022, moved $155 million of Ethereum this week. The funds were moved to the Open Ocean Decentralized Exchange and then converted into Lido Finance's staked Ether and also wrapped staked ETH. The hacker then used the Steeth as collateral to borrow stablecoins and repeat the process. This is the largest movement of these stolen funds in recent months. Speaking of exploits, the FBI announced that the Lazarus Group, a cybercrime organization sponsored by the North Korean government, is responsible for the theft of $100 million in crypto from Harmony's Horizon Bridge in June last year. The Lazarus Group has a history of orchestrating cyber attacks and is considered one of the most dangerous organizations in the world. Time for fun bits. 
Eric Wall immortalizes his enemies. Have you ever heard of the saying, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer? Well, one crypto enthusiast has been taking that phrase to a whole new level. Eric Wall, one of the best writers and analysts in the industry, is not only keeping his adversaries close, but is also etching their faces onto tungsten cubes. That's right, Eric is building a collection of cubes made of the extremely dense tungsten metal, each engraved with the face of a defeated crypto enemy. But why tungsten, you may ask? Well, it's said to be virtually indestructible and extremely resistant to scratches, kind of like Eric's arguments. As for why he's doing this, who knows? Maybe it's just his way of saying, don't mess with me, or perhaps it's simply a reminder of his past victories. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Michael, Grayscale, and GBTC, check out the show notes for this episode. If you like Unchained, please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps get word out about the show. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Mark Murdoch, Matt Pilchard, Zach Seward, Juan Aranovich, Sam Sriram, Pama Jimdar, Shashank, and CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.